city or afternoon, depending on where you are dialed in from. Um, I'm excited to get everyone talking about the new um, innovative personalization technique we've been working on, creative analytics. So with no further ado, let's get going. Um, I'm Robin Clayton, Managing Director of 55 in the US. I'm based in New York City. Um, joining me on the call today, we have Nick Yang, who is 55's global head of media. He's based in the UK. Um, and then we have Amre Achikal. He is Bayer's global director of digital marketing. So you have coverage from quite a few time zones right now. Um, looking forward to talk to you. And I think you can get all the different perspectives um, from the consulting side, from Nick Yang, someone on the ground with like the technology, the media, and then Amre, who can talk to you exactly about how it felt like um, on the buyer side, getting the solution into place. Next slide. Um, so a quick little bit about uh, 55, we're a data consulting um, company. Uh, we service the full data value chain, mostly focused on marketing and analytics, but everything from strategy and due diligence through data collection, orchestration, activation, whether it's cloud, media advisory, customer experience, we do the full thing. We work a lot with companies uh, like Omri and Bayer uh, worldwide. We have 10 offices around the globe, so we can support as we go. Um, and we're just over 400 uh, data engineers, data scientists, and data consultants coming together to make this happen. So um, if I wanna just say three things that I hope you take away from today's session. One, I hope you take away an understanding of the opportunity that we're seeing with the ability to kind of drive convergence between um, media, audience, and creatives. Um, it's something that we haven't seen uh, until recently, given new advances in AI and other tech. Um, the next thing I hope you'll take away is a real world understanding of just how impactful that can be with a real example. And third, I hope from a very pragmatic, um, once the rubber meets the road standpoint, you can understand how to actually make this happen like pretty easily, pretty quickly within your organization. Um, and if there's anything else you want to get out of it, please throw any questions you have in the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat. And if we have time, um, then we'll be having a conversation and Q&A at the end. So um, let's go. Um, so to kick us off, I'll dive into the overview on the market and opportunity. Nick will start talking to you about the solution, what we had to do to get this in place, um, everything we had to look through in terms of the, what was on the market, what wasn't on the market, how we ended up building the solution. Um, and then Omri will actually walk you through at Buyer, the real world examples, the impacts, how it felt like um, to, be, to be on the client side in his shoes. So without further ado, let's dive into creative analytics. Keep going. Okay, so when we're talking about creative analytics, I just wanna set the stage, take a moment here to talk about why this is the moment. Um, so taking a step back, when we're looking at um, personalized marketing, we're talking about the creative side of the house, the audience side and the media side. So for all intents and purposes, if you think about creative media, two sides of the proverbial coin, if you go back to the 90s, um, we had a split, right? So all of a sudden in the 90s, you have the rise of big media agencies. Uh, to run a campaign now, you have to brief multiple agencies, multiple people, and it creates um, disjointed processes, it creates silos, it creates reporting challenges, and it, it makes it harder to measure your impact. And then also from a timely standpoint, from an accuracy standpoint, all these things. Um, so fast forward, where we are today, not much has really changed since the 90s. And we're starting to see now that we have the tools to start getting um, new levels of personalization uh, with new techniques. So next. Um, when we talk about creative analytics, what is it? Um, if you think about back to the creative and the media, a lot of companies report on media quite well. Uh, they do media optimization quite well. Some companies, report on creative well, but really not so many, not many at all compared to how many are reporting well on media. And the number who are doing both creative and media reporting in tandem together well, very, very limited. I would say like pioneering at this point. Um, so we're pretty excited 
uh, to, to share this with you. As you know, media plans today are built largely um, around you know, reaching the right audience at the right time, et cetera. The media planner generally cuts the creative versions with the lowest response rate. But what we're finding when we really get into isolating the variables that make impact is that it's the creative and the audience and making sure you're getting those together that drives the most engagement and the largest incremental step changes when you're trying to drive personalization, which is pretty surprising to media planners. Um, and I guess probably to creative directors frustration because it's really the creative component that drives the engagement rate, um, which sounds pretty logical, but it's hard to actually demonstrate that. So when we're able to layer these different pieces of data together that traditionally have been pushed apart, we're seeing um, new insights and new abilities to make decisions in a way we haven't before. Um, and then next, um, so when you bring the two sides of these coins together, that's when marketing and personalization, we're seeing it to start to become really, really powerful. So instead of incremental, just like little pieces here and there in terms of engagement rates and uh, figuring out how to move people through the funnel, we're starting to see like step changes, like much bigger impacts um, as, we, as we help reach out to customers and help drive them to the next step. Um, and using automation, AI, Gen AI, we're able to bridge the gap between the two. So I'm really excited to hand it over to Nick and to Amre. Um, and next slide, where they're gonna talk a little bit more about how Buyer has moved from the current state of media planning today into kind of an evolving more future state landscape. So they're using these tools to, um, to generate more insights with audience as the key driver in order to get there. Um, so once you start putting a dollar amount on high value audiences, you're able to really, um, you're able to really drive incremental change and you're able to see how your marketing teams around the globe are able to share learning, share insights and make new decisions that they couldn't do before. All right, hand it over to you, Nick. All right, thanks Robin. So, so as we've outlined, creative analytics is all about bringing to the media and creative world to, to really deepen your understanding of, of overall campaign performance. And it's going to drive a number of different benefits, but it's worth running through just some of these in, in a little bit more detail. So having access to these enriched data sets and reports will provide your creative and media teams to derive better insights across your marketing campaigns. So for example, which combination of brand, video, or an upper funnel audience charge the highest engagement rate, or for your basket abandonment campaigns on which frame of your display banners is it best to place your call to action. This can then lead to more sophisticated personalization activations for you to run, where you can start to understand which creative and audience combos are most effective and how this can then be incorporated into future campaign plans. And this is a much more practical approach than simply determining that a certain asset or segment formed really well in isolation and then having completely separate strategies for both. And as you start to test and validate the various insights that you uncover, you'll increasingly find that your creative and marketing teams start working even closer with one another as they have access to the same reports, uh, be part of the same insight and testing conversations and work to a common set of KPIs. And all of this ultimately leads to more effective and efficient campaigns and in turn increased return on investment. And so on the next slide, we can start to see how it comes to the underlying requirements for creative analytics itself. There are four key areas that form the basis of any solution. So having an agreed set of KPIs and measures across each stakeholder group, having a solid foundation around your MarTech setup, having a clearly defined use case roadmap that you're looking to enable, and finally an established process which these capabilities would be deployed and adapted within your business. We'll touch on all of these points in more detail throughout the session. So I'm sure that a lot of you will be familiar with the concept of a maturity curve. And for creative analytics, we can see how each of these capabilities feed into the next to enable more advanced applications and use cases. So on the left-hand side, um, this is where most brands start their creative journey, um, where you have audience creative reporting largely be done in silos and really there's very limited testing in either area. Phase two is where creative analytics itself starts to kick in. And it all begins with having a unified view of both worlds 
And that means having a robust infrastructure in place to join these data sets together across multiple platforms. So that could be Meta, DV360, Campaign Manager, CRM, loads of different tools and bringing all that together will give you a much more comprehensive view of how your creatives and audiences work alongside each other within each channel. Phase three, sorry, just to go back. Um, so phase three is where start, things start to become a little bit more complex, but it's also where some of the most valuable insights and capabilities can be enabled. And by being able to integrate the actual creatives themselves into your BI solutions, it suddenly starts to become a lot more meaningful when this is combined with marketing performance data. So rather than trying to figure out in your reports why an asset that's been named Summer Sale Variant 1 worked a lot better than Summer Sale Variant 2, you can actually tangibly see both creatives alongside their associated performance metrics within your dashboard. And that becomes a much more productive and meaningful conversation to have with your media and creative teams. And finally, with phase four, we can then integrate forecasting and modeling capabilities into the solution as well. So that you can start to understand not only how well a certain creative and audience combination worked in the past, but potentially even how a new one that you never run before might perform in the future. And when it comes to activations, we're now looking at a fully dynamic setup and testing approach where you're optimizing your creative and audience activity against multiple inputs such as product feeds, frequency models, or even offline signals. And so based on our experience in embedding creative analytics across many of our clients, there are a few convictions that we feel hold true no matter what level of maturity you're at. The first being that this needs full buy-in from the business where because it will implicate multiple stakeholder groups and external partners, unless there's senior sponsorship for this initiative, it's really unlikely that you're gonna be able to affect genuine change in this area. Next is the concept of embracing automation which can come in many levels from campaign taxonomy reporting to leveraging AI to produce your creative insights themselves. All of this will naturally deploy creative analytics at scale. So you really, you'll need to, to, to move away from manual approaches and, and really kind of embed these processes within your setup to give your teams more time to focus on what really matters. And at the end, we have a simple point around testing, where ultimately, unless you try and validate the insights that you've gathered, you really won't get any of the benefits that we've outlined earlier. And so this also means being open to the possibility that some tests might not actually be successful, but that in itself is very much part of the process and is actually a good sign that you're trying to do things differently. And so the next section looks at some of the more advanced capabilities when it comes to creative analytics and how this can really start to change the way that you operate. So as we move more towards the right-hand side of the maturity curve, we inevitably bring in everyone's favorite topic, Gen AI, and how it can open up new opportunities that simply weren't an option a few years ago. But before we go into this, it's useful to split this out into the two main applications of creative analytics, which are insights and activation, both of which are enhanced by slightly different versions of AI. So the first is around using what we'll call more tra traditional AI to fuel creative insights. So this is where tools like Google's Vision API can dynamically assign attributes to any creative asset that you upload. And amongst other capabilities, be able to identify various objects or detect the presence of specific logos or text. So the output of which is that end users can easily filter, for example, all creatives with a red background and compare how this performs against all creatives with a blue background. Or you can even create performance benchmarks across each market to show all assets with certain keywords within the ad copy. So both of these examples, if you were to do it manually, would be hugely time, would be hugely time consuming and really impractical. But with something like the Vision API, you can easily kind of automate this at a click of a button. There are also other solutions such as the Video Intelligence API, which take this even further by doing things like attributing an overall tone and sentiment to your video assets, or even allowing you to automate the overall QA process of your video creatives against a specific set of best practice guidelines. 
So, so both in both solutions, it's really a great, great way to show how it can really help automate kind of underlying processes and approaches that previously would just be um, completely impractical to, to, to do on your own. And we'll have a whole dedicated section related to, to this and what we've built. So I won't spend too much time on, on this slide, but here we can see a very simple example of how AI can help or what AI can bring and how it's helped Bayer with their creative analytics. Well, within the solution that we set up for them, we can immediately understand at a drop of a filter, how the presence of the Bayer logo itself impacts creative engagement. And we can also see how this differs across each brand, each market, each audience, or even each platform, which again is something that's hugely valuable for any creative team and will have numerous other applications. And when it comes to activation itself, we can see how these AI-driven insights can then be further leveraged by generative AI, where solutions such as Pencil, who are our sister company within our wider brand tech network, can instantly produce additional creative variants based on any existing raw assets that you provide. It can also be further prompted by any insights that you've already established. So for example, ensuring that the product image is always introduced at a certain point within your video or positioning your call to action within a specific section of your display banners. So there are endless possibilities here. And for something like creative analytics, AI is really perfectly positioned to help drive this forward even further. And so with that, I'll now hand over to Emre, who will take you through how Bay have embedded creative analytics into their business. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'd like to start with our own objective, what we wanted to do. We wanted to enable precision marketing. And how we define precision marketing is showing your right creative and right message to the right people at the right time. And as you can imagine, this type of activation requires um, a bit of audience understanding, a bit of creative understanding, a bit of connecting these two and also sharing the best practices. And you will see in the case, I'll be working with 55, build the foundational capabilities for us to enable precision marketing at scale in there. Next slide, please. So before we dive into what we build, we wanted to show you some example of precision marketing in action. So rather than having one creative shown to mass audience, uh, without any segmentation can drive some results. You can have good reach and you can have good ad recall, etc. But if you divide the audience into few segments and you tailor the creative to each segment, you achieve much, much higher relevance. And this relevance yields in better engagement at first. Higher click-through rate, higher view-through rate of videos, and that was the hunch, that was the insight we got. You know, this makes our advertising more effective. And by being more re relevant, also your cost can go down over time. As you know, the publishers uh, favor the more relevant ads for their users. So next slide, please. Now, since we said we would like to enable precision marketing because precision marketing drives marketing effectiveness. The challenge with 55 was, okay, if we want to do this, we need to upgrade our traditional media analytics. Because if you think about media analytics, how much I spent by brand in mar by a market to which channel and to which campaign and how, what were what were the campaign results? This level of information may be good for media reporting. But for us, because we personalize the creatives, we wanted to see the creative level information. And that information, uh, you can't aggregate it. Uh, because to understand a creative's effectiveness, you need to see it in the right context. Which campaign and which audience, which placement was it used 
and delivered XYZ result. And that level of detail in an intuitive user interface was the challenge we would like to build with 55. So having data, creatives, and not having one or two markets, having multiple markets and almost all of our spend visualized at creative and audience level was the challenge. Next slide, please. Now, as a result, we managed to build with 55 cell uh, our solution. We call it Magellan, traversing the world, uh, seeing all the creatives in our top, more than top 10 markets and uh, almost all brands, more than 60 brands. And there are multiple reports that shows you the different views from a media person angle, from a creative person angle, from a brand manager angle, different levels of reports, helping people to better understand seeing the X-ray of the media campaign along with the creatives. And apart from what media activities delivered better results, you can have the lens of which creatives work better and which creatives don't work. And this helped uh, helped us tremendously. And, and uh, we had uh, more than 20,000 creatives analyzed through this platform so far. Next slide, please. One example is, OK, which creative works better? Again, at an aggregated level, you can't understand that because at an aggregated level, some, are, some of all the, for example, our creative agencies can help us with the answer of whether this creative worked or not, or comparing the total views of the creative and total engagement of the creative. But the numbers could be low, but when you look at the campaign line level, you see when it is used right, it is creating a better result versus when it's used wrong, for example, in the, in the wrong placement or uh, to the wrong audience, it delivers worse results. So having the right context helps us to really understand which creatives work, how much, and in which context does this creative work. And it's a tremendous insight if you put the effort analyzing those information. Next slide. Another thing is, when you have multiple markets, multiple brands, all in the same platform with the right filters, you can build your own benchmarks. Uh, a market's brand manager can easily see, you know, can celebrate, ah, I have this great team work really well for my brand in my country. But he or she can see many other markets for that brand and if their results are better than the average benchmark or not. So it helps us to elevate our benchmarks and adjusting ourselves to the best within the company. And it's uh, it's it, it creates a very data-driven environment uh, to improve the results uh, time over time. Next, please. Of course, building a tool in itself doesn't solve things. You can create magic uh, in your screen, but you need to make people use it. And, and rather than pushing people to use it, we hold hands and we show them not only how the tool can be used, but we used it for them. And we generated insights ourselves. We said, looking at from the brand angle or the market angle, you know what? We found this insight. This is the best working creative in your brand. This is the best working campaign in your market. And these are the learnings, which type of uh, modifications on the creative drives higher engagement, etc. So we showed them the insights ready and 
saying that, you can generate similar insights if you use the tool. And this helped drive um, more than 100 people within the organization using this tool, uh, brand people, marketing people using this tool to deliver value. Next, please. And that's the best slide uh, that I'm going to present, which is the results. I mean, we, most of you probably have this challenge, connecting marketing, digital marketing, digital capabilities, the business results is, is not an easy thing, especially if you're not a B2C business. Um, the key result was number one, we are able to see now what campaigns are truly personalized and which are not. And this helped us to track our progress. And more than half of our digital media is composed of personalized campaigns. And so that's already a great adoption. And when we check with the external benchmarks, uh, we are one of the best uh, in this domain. Other than that, when a campaign is personalized, we consistently see it has a higher ROI because it's much more relevant for consumers. Uh, with the same spend, you can generate more engagement and more sales. And, and uh, we consistently see higher view-through rates and click-through rates in our ads. And lastly, as I say, we have more than 100 users and more users are coming in and, and exploring the tool. With that, I hand over back to Robin. All right. Thank you very much. Well, again, this was informative. I hope that um, if you have any questions, feel free. Don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I also hope that you took away three things. One, what is creative analytics and why is it important? Two, how does it work? What kinds of things do you need to consider in order to do it? And three, I hope you're excited um, from Emre's example and the success he's seeing and um, have some clarity in terms of next steps for what you can do to bring this back um, to your organizations and your teams. Thanks so much for your time today. Let me just do a quick check in the chat. Do we have any questions? Okay, I have one question uh, for Amre. Um, when you tried to scale this solution, did you face any change management challenges internally? What was what were some of the obstacles you faced and how did you navigate them? Yes, we, we faced many challenges. Uh, I mean, there we faced, I would group them into like one on technical side and second on uh, people side. On um, technical side, this level of global solution with that depth of detail requires a, a almost perfect taxonomy and 100% uh, correct implementation of that taxonomy, which involves multiple agencies and multiple people. And that was one of the top parts uh, that we we created separate processes and solutions to enable 100% taxonomy correctness in our organization. The people side, the, the challenge was, you know, I was thinking everybody would jump on this solution, but some people uh, resisted because while democratizing all the information, you also surface all the details of the executions local markets are doing. And the good ones are amplified, but also you can easily see the bad executions or the opportunities in the executions. And this created a lot of challenges to some people who consistently had negative results. For the business, it's good, but for individual people, we had some challenges. But overall, um, like all change management, there are there has been some difficulties, but uh, we're overcoming them. Thank you. You're getting hit up for questions right now. Sorry, a couple more straight at you. Um, do you have all of your brands running on the same marketing stack, or was it possible to build such a solution within 
heterogeneous ecosystem. Sorry, apparently I need another coffee. <laughs> I mean, I can answer some parts and mm -hmm. make it. Nick yeah, can chime in on. Yeah. Yes. So we have we utilize the native tech stacks of the publishers. For example, for Google properties, we use GMP. For Meta, we use Meta's um, studio. But because this tool is not about buying, you can use wherever, whichever solution you want uh, to buy the media. But this tool or this solution pulls the information back. It pulls all the campaign information from GMP, from Meta, from YouTube, and we could even pull data from Amazon, Trade Desk, different uh, tech stacks. And with a robust taxonomy, you can unify those information, different campaigns, and you can pull also the creatives from those platforms and show it in a in an independent, uh, interoperable environment. Yeah, getting yeah, to yeah, I think Emre's spot on in terms of the, the actual tools themselves aren't as important as kind of the, the way in which you're able to join those different data, data sets together. So I guess in reference to your question, Julia, it, it doesn't really matter if all of your different brands or markets aren't necessarily using the exact tech stack as long as there's the underlying infrastructure and setup for us to, to join those different platforms and, and, and tools together. Um, it will perhaps be slightly more difficult if there are a number of different platforms, but ultimately it's it's still the same. It's still the same challenge, just scaled across additional tools. Maybe one add on that would be like the taxonomy to Amory's point earlier is key, having the taxonomy down. Yeah, and I guess kind of on that point, that's where I think I mentioned earlier, having something around automation is is really important where having a kind of a scalable solution that can monitor taxonomy across multiple brands and markets and platforms and, and providing all the relevant stakeholders with kind of immediate view of exactly which areas need a bit of attention. And if possible, even introducing, let's say, Gen AI into the equation where you can actually recommend and suggest the appropriate updated version of the taxonomy so that your marketing teams can immediately take that recommendation and apply it directly into the platforms so you can really complete that end-to-end -end process where you use gen ai to create the recommendation and then leverage various apis to actually push that recommended um updated taxonomy with kind of human approval directly into the platform so no manual intervention kind of needs um or implementation needs to, to happen which really helps streamline the overall process All right, I think we're seeing a few questions in terms of um, what kind, like when we talk about personalization and we talk about engagement, um, what are we actually doing? So what kind of personalization is done um, against high value audiences? Um, and what kinds of variables are we optimizing against? Is it engagement by interactions, post view, um, brand impact. So maybe we could talk a little bit about the kind of personalization we're doing at the audience, high value audience level, as well as some of the um, engagement um, indicators that we're measuring that we're seeing um, really be impactful. Yeah, I can I can take that. Um, in Bayer Consumer Health, we have multiple categories: pain, vitamins, intimate care. And each of those categories, and even if you go into the brand level, has different high value audience approaches. For example, some categories can segment or identify the high value consumers based on their interest or lifestyle. Uh, for example, on, on digestive care, uh, fast food is a highly correlated uh, interest area with uh, certain symptoms. So interest is one angle. The second one is in some markets, we have access to purchase data or category buying information of consumers. So you can also define, again, based on brand strategy, there's no one size fits all, but some brands want to segment consumers with existing 
buyers or new to category buyers or lapsed users. Another could be demographics, where you can have different offerings or different claims based on age, gender, um, and and the last one is the environmental variables. There are some categories which we call them trigger-based, like pollen, for example. Independent of who you are, uh, if you have allergy, the allergy information, the pollen count at geography level, could be the segment information, uh, segmentation information, enabling us to advertise in domains where there's high pollen, which helps us to uh, tailor our advertising strategy based on geography. So there's no one size fits all, but we use a combination of that and each brand in the market defines what is key, what dimensions are key for their strategy. And just in reference to kind of a more specific point around measuring brand impact. So that's something we were able to integrate into uh, the Magellan solution that we set up with Emre's team uh, at Bayer, where uh, for all the YouTube brand lift studies and, and campaigns that they ran, we integrated that into, into their BI solution. So again, you can see the YouTube video itself, the number of clicks and impressions and website visits they generated, and also the actual brand uplift results as, as well, which is a, a really powerful uh, capability for uh, a CPG brand such as Bayer, where because they're not a D2C brand, they don't necessarily have the same tracking capabilities that uh, an e-commerce company might have. So brand impact is a hugely valuable kind of measure um, of, of creative and marketing success. And again, being able to tie that back to the specific YouTube video um, itself is, is a really valuable um, capability for both the marketing and creative teams, respectively. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Let me check. I think that answers. Um, all right. We got one more. Um, when we think about pharma and health, um, were there any kind of restrictions or, or category nuances you had to take into account? And if so, um, were they, why were they, or why were they not um, an issue? Yeah, indeed. In, in pharma, we have much more restrictions. And when we say pharma, I refer to prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And in general, consumer marketing is not allowed in many markets. Um, you can only reach out to healthcare professions in certain regulated channels. Uh, in consumer health, though, uh, you can reach out to consumers, but what you can say and what you can't say is highly regulated. Plus, in case you are collecting first-party data, it's much more stringent, it's much more um, you know, sensitive data because um, it can be easily linked to people's health. But again, coming back to, so these are the very general industry restrictions uh, around it, but this tool, again, is not buying the media. So media buying and creative messaging, legal, medical, regulatory review happens. And the media buying happened and we aired the creative. Then, the challenge starts. Then, how can we know which one worked, which one didn't work, and what does it work mean even um, across channels? And that's the that's the power of this tool. And because this tool itself is built on the campaign data, it has nothing to do with individual consumer level information. So it's it's quite exempt from many data privacy restrictions or regulatory restrictions because you're basically a bit of your agency media report plus the creative detail uh, that works. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you. All right, let me just do a quick scan. I think we're getting towards the end. Um, okay, this one is for the whole group. Um, I'm gonna hand this one over to you, Nick. Um, what is the best place for a brand to start with their creative analytics journey? Um, cool, so I think if kind of you're more on the left-hand side of that maturity curve that, that, that we went through, earlier it's i think the best place to start is really kind of getting that initial combined view of creative um and audience data together um so that's really what we talked about earlier with emory around kind of joining different platforms and, and data sets and putting that all in in one single place or across things like facebook and campaign manager and youtube bringing that all together and having ensuring that the right setup between uh, creative and audience, there is that underlying taxonomy that can enable and facilitate um, the integration of those data sets. So that within a single report, you have within the same row, your creative information and your media performance information all, all in one go. And then once you've done that, then you can start to apply kind of the more additional or more advanced capabilities, such as bringing in the actual creative asset itself. So you can visualize the YouTube video or see the actual Facebook promoted post um, within within your performance metrics, then you can start to bring in all of those different AI capabilities that, that we also went through. Um, but but to start with is really kind of giving you, making sure that the foundations are in place with that kind of comprehensive view of cross market and cross channel uh, performance between media and, and, and creative. Yeah, building on that, I would also say the brand's business challenges to me should be the starting point. It's not always like that, but the, the, the one of the barriers we have when you bring in such a capability to a big organization, it looks very shiny. People like what it can do, but they don't really know how, what it, what does it mean for their business, for their brand? And it requires a bit of reverse engineer to bring them to the level of understanding what it can do for their brand. So ideally, I would start from the brand's business challenges in the market. If, it's a, if they have a penetration challenge to certain uh, groups of consumers, if they have a loyalty challenge. So they generally talk these type of business challenges. And then you need to turn that question into, okay, to address that challenge, what can your media and creatives do? What do you want them to serve for? And then the objectives, business objectives come into play. And related to that, the questions arise. Then brands want to understand, ah, I'd like to understand which of my message resonates better with the younger audience because I have a penetration challenge. When you have such business questions on the table, this tool can create the magic because then it can help you answer those questions in a very data-driven manner uh, using looking at creatives at the right context, how they were aired. And you can really answer this type of sophisticated business question. So in short to me, creatives analytics journey, if it's if it starts from the technical team, you need to reverse engineer. So this is why it, it needs to start from the business challenges and questions and they need to be translated into creative analytics questions. And that would be the best route. All right, thank you, Amre. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions in the chat. So um, hope everybody got something out of this. Enjoy the time. Um, thanks for joining. And uh, we'll send the follow-up right shortly. Please reach out if you uh, have any other thoughts, questions, comments uh, after the webinar. Thank you.